silver production from Mexico and Peru, the world's two largest producers, is at its lowest point in 14 years. As gold breaks out to record levels, igniting a new bull market for precious metals, a major supply-demand mismatch is poised to, dr to drive silver prices significantly higher. Hi, this is Mike Maloney, and I want to welcome you to the front porch of my little base camp house up on my farm here, uh, where we're getting ready for any potential outcomes. I mean, we're getting ready for the, you know, prepare for the worst, but hope for the best. And uh, up here, we grow a lot of our own food. I've got my own water supply, and I've got a bunch of solar panels and Tesla power walls. We're completely off of the grid. I believe that one of the greatest crashes in history is just around the corner now, and it's coming up, and I see it coming, and I am bracing for impact, and I'm buckling up and getting ready for it. So let's take a look at what's going on. This was a very impressive chart uh, posted by Sam Rowe, uh, and it's the market cap of the largest stock, so it's a single stock relative to the 75th percentile uh, of stocks. And so you see that peak back in 1932 and other peaks like in 2000, but we are off the charts here. So that means that the stock market is very warped. Everybody's been going after just the largest stocks. Then if you look at uh, the, this article on goldsilver.com that was produced by my team, uh, gold has surged to all uh, new all-time highs. The NASDAQ and uh, the S&P 500 blazed to record highs. Meanwhile, billionaires are selling stocks. A recent article from Forbes reported that Jeff Bezos, Leon Black, uh, Jamie Dimon, and the Walton family have sold a combined $11 billion in company stock. So this is, you know, they're selling $11 billion worth of their own assets and uh, moving that to cash, basically. Uh, so moving on, um, these are the uh, largest outflows ever from tech funds. So this only goes back to 2017. So I don't know if it's ever, but uh, major, major outflows. Moving on. Uh, right now, the credit card debt, so the, the you know, average American uh, is surviving on credit cards right now. Uh, and, you know, they're using it as a backup. But it's over a trillion bucks now that people owe on their credit cards. So this is huge and it's dangerous. And we're going into a worsening economy right now, as I'll show you. Uh, meanwhile, the Bank of Japan is considering scrapping its yield curve control program. Uh, it'll stop its program to guide benchmark 10-year government bond yields to around 0% in an effort to normalize monetary policy. And this could be as early as March 19th. And so uh, today is the Sunday the 10th. And so that's just around the corner, basically. Uh, in the United States, uh, the currency supply the M2 currency supply is shrinking. Uh, it's gone negative. If you look at the times in history that it's gone negative, we have the depression of 1921. It went severely negative after the big inflation uh, for World War I. Huge inflation, and then uh, they shut off the currency supply spigots, and there was this huge contraction. Then we've got the roaring 20s here and the crash of 29, uh, brought on the Great Depression. So we had this, this big contraction. And the government responded with, um, the Federal Reserve responded with all of this currency creation and the government trying to devalue the dollar. And they did. They took the dollar from uh, $20.67 an ounce of gold, or in other words, um, one twentieth of an ounce of gold to one thirty-fifth of an ounce of gold in 1934. They uh, banned private ownership of uh, gold bars and coins in 33 and then in 34 uh, they allowed for a month they would allow the exchange rates to change uh, internationally and the free market and the will of the public internationally caused the price they, they would uh, let it float the exchange rate would change a little bit and then they would peg it again they would let it float and peg it again they did this for about a month and the uh, they, they pegged it at 35, which more than covered the amount of dollars that had been created 
uh, since the Federal Reserve that weren't fully backed by gold. So now it could be fully backed by gold again. But then we had a recession within a depression. This did, the, all this currency expansion did not get us out of the Great Depression. There was the Roosevelt recession of 1938. Then it was uh, World War uh, II and the gold flows basically for World War II. Running up to uh, World War II, uh, Europe took all of their young men, turned them into soldiers, nobody left on the farms, and so they had to import all of their grains and a whole lot of consumer goods uh, from the United States. And our gold stocks went way up. And this is part of what lifted us out of, everybody thinks that war is good for the economy. It is not. You're only building things that are going to blow up and, and uh, destroy uh, many other very expensive things. And you're making bullets that are going to kill other young men that could be working. Um, and then we had uh, a couple of pretty good recessions back in the 50s. But other than that, the currency supply growth has been pretty constant since, uh, the, you know, since the late 50s. And for the first time since the late 50s, it is contracting. Why? What is causing the M2 currency supply to contract? Well, M2 is, cur is, is largely made up of bank credit. It, the, the dollars that are in the M2 measurement of the currency supply is the currency in circulation portion of, um, of uh, base currency, uh, so the dollars in your wallet, paper dollars, and bank credit. And so if you take a look at bank credit, it's also contracting. Now, it contracted in the global financial crisis in 2000. Uh, nine and ten, it was contracting. Um, and what's interesting, you know, I uh, wanted to look at this on the Federal Reserve's website. So I went and created basically the same chart. This one, though, is quarterly to smooth the lines a little bit more. But you can see the contraction uh, that it was after this recession. And this time, there's a contraction, and there is no official recession yet. It's contracting. And there's no f official recession. But every time you, can, you see this sharp drop uh, it come, it caused by a recession, this sharp drop uh, predicted a recession, and we had the recession. This sharp drop was caused by a recession. This sharp drop started before the recession. So this is both a leading and a trailing indicator. But every time there's a, a recession, the currency supply is contracting. And this time it's negative, and the only other time on this graph that it's negative was shortly after the global financial crisis and the recession that it caused. So why is the currency supply contracting? What causes bank credit to contract? Well, uh, median price homes are, are sharply contracting. So what causes home prices to fall is that there's uh, not enough buyers out there. So there's fewer buy buyers and the price falls, which means there's fewer loans being made. When, lo when there's fewer home loans being made than paid, the currency supply contracts. When you pay the principal on your loan, that, uh, borrowed, that bank credit that was borrowed into existence meets the uh, debit on the balance sheet and they annihilate each other. And so um, this, the, the Falling home prices is one of the factors. There's fewer loans being made than are being paid. So as we pay down those loans, it destroys currency. And normally, the economy keeps on growing and more loans are being made to make up for the loans that are being paid off. So the, the, the falling home prices and the lack of demand for homes is causing the, the bank credit to contract, which is causing the currency supply to contract. So. Uh, here is the same thing with the re recession bars in it. Let me go back to this one goes back to 1964 and mine also goes back to 1964. So this is the Fed data and you can see that when it contracts it can bring on a recession and it contracts and brings on a recession. It contracts, it brings on a recession. Here the recession had already started but normally the contraction is what causes the recession. <laughs> and look at the contraction. This is the biggest contraction in 
measured history. And so uh, we are in for some big crash coming up sometime soon. And then they, you know, after we get uh, two quarters of, so it's sometime like three, it'll be nine months after a recession begins where they say, oh, the uh, last previous, two previous quarters were contraction, that's when the recession began. So their declaration of recession is a trailing indicator. Um, anyway, uh, in the last video that I made, I showed you the inverse head and shoulders pattern. So here it is, <laughs> the inverse head and shoulders. But, you know, uh, gold uh, was going up a little bit. It pulled back. It made this triple top with a head and two shoulders inverted. And it predicted this big move, a slingshot move. Well, we sort of got that. And we had, I, I said that we had had seven trading days up in a row that were up. And uh, so it was sort of due for a pullback. Well, now it's eight trading days in a row with no down days. And so it is probably due for a pullback. And I want to show you silver, which only had six up days. But notice this candle here. This is called a doji. And uh, this is a red doji where it, it uh, opened higher than it closed. So it closed down. But that often predicts a reversal. Uh, and so here we have a doji on Friday the 8th of March. And it, it very often, like I said, predicts a reversal. Uh, this is where investors really can't make up their mind. Is it going up? Is it going down? And uh, now the next chart is a little scary for any silver investor. This is the borrowing fee. Looks like someone is in a panic to borrow shares of SLV. SLV is the exchange traded fund for silver, the big one. Uh, the borrowing uh, fee nearly doubled in the last hour of trading, a new high on the year. Uh, and he just wants people to try and get this out. So I'm helping him here get this out. But look at the, I mean, this is huge going from there to there in one trading day. So somebody is trying to borrow a lot of uh, shares of SLV. Why do you borrow shares? You only borrow shares when you're going to sell them into the market. You're going to sell short. Uh, when you sign up for a margin-enabled trading account, so if you have a brokerage uh, account and it's margin-enabled, uh, you have given your broker permission to go into your account and borrow share, your shares and not tell you. So your shares may or may not be there. This is one of the things I do not like about all of these ETFs. It's hocus-pocus, high finance hocus-pocus. And so they borrow these shares, they loan them to somebody else who wants to sell short, he sells it short into the market, and now you have two people owning the same ounces. You think you've got ounces in your account, your broker has not told you, gone in there, borrowed them, loaned them to somebody else, who now has those ounces and sells them into the market. So now there's a new owner of the same ounces that you own. And uh, that uh, the borrower eventually has to buy them back. But that borrower is betting that the price is going to go down. And you'll notice this happened uh, toward the end of the day is what, um, what uh, Bob Coleman says. Uh, so if it's toward the end of the day, that's what made up that uh, red doji that we just saw, the price closing down lower than the open. Now, hi, I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for subscribing and mention that if you'd like to help our channel, please consider my company, goldsilver.com, the next time you buy precious metals. We're one of the most trusted names in the industry. Our prices are sharp, delivery is fast, and we have an insider's program where you find out exactly what I'm doing with my own investments. Thanks for making goldsilver.com your dealer. And now back to the video. This is nothing to worry about in the long term, uh, but you have to sort of buckle up and be ready for all of this. And if you don't have a large enough position in silver, you may want to uh, consider buying this dip. I, I never give advice. I just tell people what I see and what I do. Uh, but I do think that there's a, a little correction coming from the price explosion that we've had over the past few days. But the silver production in Mexico and Peru uh, is, is way down. Silver production from Mexico and Peru, the world's two largest producers, 
is at its lowest point in 14 years. The combined output is now down 25% from its 2016 peak levels. And that's from my friend uh, Tavi Costa. And so uh, as gold breaks out to record levels, igniting a new bull market for precious metals, a major supply-demand mismatch is poised to, dr to drive silver prices significantly higher. So we have all of this going for silver in the long term, this supply-demand imbalance. And, and the only thing that makes supply meet demand is price. That's, that, that's the leveler. Um, and so from Peter Spina of GoldSeek, he says, uh, silver prices are nearly 11% higher now in China. So there is this divergence. And uh, let me see. I can, I'm staring into it. There's a white cloud up there that's real bright. Um, and so in China, here, here we have 2448 uh, on the COMEX and 2667 on the Shanghai uh, exchange for silver. And that means that uh, somebody can buy in the United States and sell a futures contract there and then ship the, you know, take delivery of the silver, ship it to China. And so what this causes is gold and silver are currently flowing from the, the west to the east, which is tragic in my opinion, because after this is all said and done, uh, the west is going to be a lot poorer and the east is going to be a lot richer. Uh, so... Uh, I showed you this in my last video from Jim Bianco, uh, where uh, he says that uh, the gold price in orange, and, and that's the, and the cumulative outflows of all ten gold ETFs, is in blue, and there was a divergence that happened in late 2022. So there was there was a little bit of a divergence right here that was short lived, but um, uh, Luke Groman. Uh, Here's Luke Groman. Uh, this is the gold price and the tonnage in GLD, the Gold Exchange Traded Fund. And he's got these two circles where the tonnage was falling dramatically. Um, in my opinion, an interesting bank run of sorts is on our screen right now being shown by the black line below. One, where, where's this tonnage, this gold tonnage going? In 2013 through 16, it mostly went to China. So here it went to China. Why is the gold, uh, why is the price of gold going up during this run on physical gold uh, when it went down during the 2013 2016 period? The people in China are buying. That is the reason this is going up. And so now I want to show you something that is happening in China right now that is quite amazing. And I want to read to you from uh, an excerpt from the uh, chapter, I believe this is chapter 8 in my book. But I'll, I'll play this. You can watch segments of this while I read the book. So we'll go back and forth from this to the book. And, uh, and so, Dan, if you can um, uh, play this, uh, you know, and then uh, go back to the booked text while I'm reading it. But... Um, these are people in China lining up to buy gold, and this is panic buying. And it's, it's happened before, but not in China. The last time there was a, a big gold rush, uh, it was illegal to own gold in China. That was under Mao. And so here we are with ex excerpts from my book. To give you an idea of the emotion and psychology that was driving the gold price in 1979-1980, I've included an excerpt from an early draft of my first book. So most of this got cut out of my first book. Gold had started rising from $35 an ounce almost immediately after leaving the dollar. But in 1971, anyone who said gold could reach $50 an ounce was considered crazy, and anyone who said that $100 was possible was tied up, hauled away, and placed in a rubber room. But in late 1978, it broke through the $200 barrier, and something changed in how gold was being traded and how gold was being viewed by the public. Gold was once again acting like money. Time Magazine, June 11, 1979, Ingot We Trust. 
in the past two years, a brand, a, a, a new brand of buyers has flocked to the market. American institutional investors, some U.S. pension funds, mutual funds, and bank trust departments are putting a portion of their assets into bullion. Now, this has not happened yet. This is uh, uh, something that still lies out there in the future. Uh, there are very, there's, when it comes to institutional investors, almost none of them have any gold whatsoever. So back to my story. In 1979, people started lining up in front of coin shops and the phones were ringing off the hook at the commodities exchanges. Time Magazine, October 1st, 1979, The Glitter That Is Gold. From Zurich to Chicago, from London to Hong Kong, gold bugs are scurrying once again to buy into their favorite hedge against disaster. With people battered by inflation and recession, worried about oil and lacking confidence in leaders and cures, the gold rush of 1979 has turned into a stampede. In the past month, silver has risen 65% while gold has gone up 23%. The popularity of such tangible assets reflects a fast-deepening distrust of all paper currencies. Essentially, the price of gold is an index of anxiety and a barometer of fears. Back to my story. Gold had begun, uh, back to my story, gold had begun September of 1979 at $315, and by October 2nd, the day after this article, it hit $426, a 35% rise in one month. Gold languished for the next two months, but then, on December 3rd, gold surpassed its previous high, and it was off to the races. Time Magazine, January 28th, 1980, Stampede for precious metal. Last week, gold left even its most frenzied boosters gawking in astonishment. In five wild and erratic trading days, it leapt by an incredible 34%. It was one of the most dazzling run-ups in history, and it underscored the enduring psychological lure of the yellow metal as the most consistently sought-after possession in times of strife and uncertainty. Harvard social psychologist Roger Brown compares the panic to the rush on the gates of the Who concert in Cincinnati that left 11 dead. Says he, the fear that they are going to be too late and left out causes people to stampede. In cities throughout the U.S. and Europe, people by the thousands lined up at jewelry and coin shops lured by newspaper headlines of eye-popping new prices for gold and silver and even by hourly news broadcasts on the radio. Again, None of this is happening yet, and, but it will. It's still out there in the future, so there is still time. Of course, the rise reflects intensifying anxiety over the world situation, particularly the crises in Afghanistan and Iran. Do we have a crisis in the Middle East right now? <laughs> so, the Middle East has been this constant sore spot, but you know, when they say Afghanistan here, that's when Russia was trying to occupy Iran or Afghanistan, I mean, and we had a problem in Iran. And so, uh, uh, but now we've got these other crises going on in the Middle East, uh, and we are closer to nuclear war than at any time in history. Uh, you know, even probably closer than the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. In times of such uh, grave concern, people are moved to switch out of paper currencies and into objects that seem immune to political travail. Observes Alan Greenspan, who, by the way, was not yet Fed chairman and was a big supporter of the gold standard. Gold is a store of value that governments cannot seize, devalue, or easily confiscate. Still, the U.S. eventually may pay a high price if bullion keeps leaping. If the dollar is worth only one eight hundredth of an ounce of gold, then it seems to be worth almost nothing. Well, today, the dollar is worth one twenty-two hundredth of an ounce of gold. Now back to my story. I remember this fairly well. I remember watching the local news broadcasts and being amazed at the helicopter shots of the line of people waiting to get into the, a local coin dealer. This dealer was only a few miles from my home, located on a major city street in the center of the block with sidewalks about 15 feet wide, and the line of people went out the front door, stretched down the block, filling the sidewalk around the corner and up the side street. The news media were interviewing people in line, and the lines were being compared to those of Star Wars and Apocalypse Now, adding it all up. So now, 
Let's add it all up and try to estimate just how much currency could come chasing gold and silver in the great gold and silver rush of the 21st century. Versus 1980, today we have 18 times more people around the world that can buy precious metals, 55 times more currency, 56 times more millionaires, 200 times more billionaires, 220 times more available consumer credit, 31.5 times more assets under management, and 49 times greater global stock market capitalization. Now, the reason I mention assets under management and the uh, 200 times more billionaires is because these are people that can literally steer uh, in, in at any moment. They can steer a billion dollars here or a billion dollars there, and they have not been rushing into gold yet. Yet. Uh, so... I'm going to skip to the end and um, read you that. But remember, price means nothing. Value is everything. So how much can you get for your ounce of gold? I believe that for every ounce of gold and silver you own today, you are going to be able to buy many, many times more stocks, bonds, real estate, businesses, and just about anything else you want or need. One day, the precious metals are going to amaze everyone. Make sure you come back and reread this chapter once gold goes soaring past $3,000, $5,000, $10,000 per ounce and never looks back because the great gold and silver rush of the 21st century is absolutely going to take your breath away. And now I want to end with this meme. Currency wars, are we winning? Well, right now there is this uh, transfer of gold from west to east, and, and we're settling in currency, paper currency. When this is all over with, when, is, when all is said and done, the east will be far richer, the west will be far poorer. Uh, I am getting ready for the greatest crash in history, so I am bracing for impact, I am buckling up, and my safety belt is precious metals. It is gold and silver, that's my safety belt. What is your safety belt? I want to thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. We'll see you next time.